Welcome to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. We are so excited that you are joining us for the show today. This podcast aims to explore a biblical life view in a conversational tone. Let's join our host and founder of Servants of Grace, Dave Jenkins, for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening. Welcome back to the Equipping You in Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And with me today, I have my new friend, Hal. Hal, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, it's been wonderful just to get to chat with you a little bit and and, uh, get to know you and and to share a little bit about myself. So that's really awesome. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about your life, marriage, ministry, and some of the current ministry projects that you're working on? Yes, I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina. I uh, started growing going to church uh, nine months before I was born, was always in church. I became a Christian, trusted Christ as my Savior when I was eight years old. By the time I was 10 years old at a, at a church camp, I realized the Lord had called me to preach. I kept that a secret. I didn't tell a soul because I didn't want to do it. I wanted to be, even at the age of 10, a politician. And uh, my plan was to go into law and politics, the United States Senate, and then finally President of the United States. By the way, Bill Clinton had my presidency. That was my plan. But all along the way, the Lord kept reminding me, I have called you to preach. I was active in politics. I was involved in uh, on the committee to re-elect the president in uh, the 1972 presidential campaign. I resigned from the committee in, ju- uh, in July, a month after Watergate, because I knew in my bones uh, that the uh, the campaign had been involved. I, I just had real, oh, squeamish feelings about the people running the campaign. And so that was when I had this um, uh, difficult decision, difficult because that was what I wanted, opposite to what I think the Lord was calling me to do. It took me a while. I I was the um, finance director of the South Carolina Republican Party during the 1974 gubernatorial race. When um, uh, Nixon resigned in August of that campaign year and Republicans lost almost every election in the country except South Carolina where we elected the first uh, Republican governor in a century. But in the midst of that campaign, I did go forward and tell my pastor and my church that the Lord had called me to preach and I was going to be leaving politics. So I left, went to seminary, eventually did a PhD as well as the Master of Divinity. Uh, While I was working on my PhD, I was a prison chaplain in Kentucky. The Kentucky State Reformatory is a medium security prison, did some of my research work at Oxford, and upon finishing my degree, I served as pastor of the Simpsonville Baptist Church in Kentucky, just outside of Louisville. I was then on the staff of the Kentucky Baptist Convention in their evangelism office, then uh, was asked to teach at Southern Seminary, where I taught uh, evangelism, Uh, then spent a few years at Bethel Seminary, a Baptist seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, was asked to come back to Southern, where I continued to teach evangelism, but also served as the associate vice president for academic programs for the university. Our vice president, David Dockery, was elected president of Union University, and he asked me to go to Union with him. Until then, I had been preparing pastors, but one of the things I learned as a pastor and traveling the state working with pastors was the desperate need for lay leadership in churches. And I I felt the Lord uh, calling me to come to Union and help prepare lay leaders for the churches. So I've been here since um, 1996, 23 years. When I was in seminary, when I was um, in my PhD program, I met and married uh, Mary Ann Whitten from Memphis. Uh, So we've been married since 1981. We have two children, two daughters, Rebecca and Mary Ellen. And Mary Ann also teaches here at Union. She's, in fact, the dean of the School of Social Work. And throughout my ministry, going back to that original calling, uh, when I was at the church camp, we had a a missionary from Brazil talking about how many people had never heard about Jesus. And I kept thinking, well, why doesn't somebody tell them? And that was the context of my call. 
to tell people about Jesus. So I always thought that meant being a pastor. But throughout my unplanned ministry, when I left politics, I had to give up ambition too. So I've never had a job that I applied for. It's offers that have come out of the clear blue sky. And I had to then consider, well, is the Lord in this? Is he calling me to do something different? So I've had a a wild ministry uh, in terms of what anyone would plan. I told the Lord at the front end, I'll do absolutely anything except prison ministry, denominational work, and teaching. And um, in that order, that's what I've done. So he has a sense of humor, even if we don't always in the midst of it. What's drawn all of my ministry together is understanding how to present the gospel to a culture that is dramatically different from the one I was born into in 1950. And so uh, I've written, I'm working on my 20th book right now, and all of them, some having to do with science and religion, some having to do with integration of faith and learning, some having to do with post-modernity, C.S. Lewis, all sorts of different things. It looks like there's nothing in common. What they all deal with is how the gospel addresses the deep, questions of the culture. And I believe that God has placed a question in every heart that only the gospel answers. And our responsibility as Christians is to listen for the question and rely on the Holy Spirit to help us provide the answer from the gospel. So that's what I've been up to. In addition to my teaching here at Union, I do a lot of speaking off campus at different kinds of of, uh, groups. And I've got a small organization we call the Inklings Fellowship. We do a, a retreat every April in Montreat, North Carolina, way up in the Smoky Mountains. It's like being in Rivendale. And we also put on an academic conference every March for professors to uh, present papers on uh, how they think about their discipline from a Christian perspective, sometimes called the integration of faith and learning. Then every third year, we go to Oxford for a week for what we call an Inklings Week in Oxford and take a theme from Lewis Tolkien and their friends that addresses culture today. So there's a lot to keep me busy. The job is never done. Well, it's wonderful to get to know you a little bit and and to hear what the Lord is up to. Uh, Could you tell us about your your book, Becoming C.S. Lewis, a biography of young Jack Lewis, um, why you wrote it and how you hope it'll be received? Yes. It's a book I had not planned on writing. I teach a course on C.S. Lewis, and I've written a number of articles about him and a couple of books. But I was just reading a passage in which he remarked on the fact that he liked to eat. I didn't know what he liked to eat. It was just idle curiosity. And I thought, well, I don't remember him ever saying anything in particular except Turkish delight in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And I thought there must be more to it than that. And I thought, well, why don't I look through his letters and see if he ever mentions any particular meal or menu or thing that his favorite food, that sort of thing. So I started in the very beginning when he was a little boy. His letters have been published in three volumes. And started working my way through. He went away to school soon after his mother died when he was right on the verge of 10 years old. And he wrote out to his father every week. Later, he would write to his brother and to his best friend. So we have a lot of letters from that period. And by the time he was 16 years old, I realized, oh my goodness, during his late childhood and his adolescence, Lewis developed all of his major preferences, the things he liked and the things he didn't like. And it would be such things as is he loved to walk. He took long walks, 10-mile walks, 15-mile walk. He hated team sports, and he hated them because he didn't have a double-jointed thumb like most humans do. He only had one joint in his thumb, and as a result, he was very clumsy, couldn't catch a ball or, or throw a ball. The team sports are, are built around balls of different kinds, whether it's a basketball, a football, a baseball. In England, it would be a cricket ball, a rugby ball. As a result, he was also generally clumsy, and that made him awkward on the playing field. And as a child and a teenager, if you weren't good at sports, then you had no validity as a human being. So he came in for enormous cruelty, really. He was just terribly treated by the other boys. And so, um, as a result, he he hated sports the rest of his life, organized sports. Uh, He hated math. He should have been good at math. His mother was brilliant in math. And his arguments in um, both mere Christianity and miracles betray someone who has a highly logical mind which is to say a mathematical mind. 
and he hated math because the boarding school where his father sent him when he was uh, in late childhood was overseen by a headmaster who had already been certified insane by a British court of law. And yet he was running this school. He beat the children mercilessly. And his subject that he taught was math. And if you got the, the answer right, he'd beat you with a cane. If he got the answer wrong, he'd beat you with a cane. So it really didn't matter. And as a result, Lewis just hated math. But so many other things, the literature that he loved to read and so much else, these things developed when he was a child. And I realized there's a story here that needs to be told. And it has, uh, it's it's not just a matter of curiosity for people who might like Lewis. One of my biggest concerns over the years has been the general failure of American churches to adequately provide youth ministry. And youth ministry, I think, has been a general failure for the last 60 years, ever since the 1960s and the revolutions of the 60s. Churches have been, I think, inadequate to the task. Youth ministry has mainly been the big meeting where we get them all together, just try and keep them there, hope they won't ask awkward questions, and tell them what the answers are, and stop asking those questions. There's a certain pattern so that so many teenagers graduate from high school School and graduate from church. So in a sense, Lewis is a case study of a teenager who was brought up in church, who attended the church where his grandfather was the pastor, and who rejected Christianity as a teenager and became a, a devout and avowed atheist. So one of the things I'm looking at are the, the dynamics that led to that as well as uh, how do you evangelize someone in that position. And that constitutes tens of millions of Americans. So it has both uh, just an interest for people interested in Lewis, but as far as uh, a ministry resource, I hope it'll be helpful to uh, youth ministers and pastors and anyone interested in reaching teenagers. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, as you're talking, I'm thinking, I was the opposite. The, the questions that I had led me to read books. It, it, it led me to ask questions and then to go and, and find books that would answer my questions and to read my Bible. And I just had an insatiable appetite to do so. And I guess, and, and, and it went the opposite way for me than, than with than with Lewis, you know, in that um, I was in a good church, although we didn't really ask questions per se. It wasn't like against asking questions, but, but I just had lots of questions and um, just an insatiable appetite just to read and, and to study. And, and so I did. And I, I came to find the answers. So that, um, but there are a lot of young people that that do have a lot of questions, and they they're the opposite. They're they're not naturally curious, or, or they don't have a safe place to ask questions, or they're discouraged from asking questions. You know, you're you're absolutely right about youth ministry. I think it, and by extension, I think you're even more accurate about the church as a whole. In that we view questions in it, and as almost like, well, you asked that question. Well, you should already know the answer to that question because you've probably been a, been a Christian a long time, right? And, and somebody might even say it that way. I, I no doubt they would, but... You know, that's not the right way to, to invite people to, to learn and to, to feel comfortable to ask questions. One of the things I, I, I try to do is is just to, when I when I had a Bible study, we would we would even stop the Bible study because the, the whole Bible study would end up being their questions. They had questions about what we were studying in the Gospel of John and the, the doctrines therein. And I, I would just go to the board and write down the question and we would talk about it and I would give an answer. You know, and I think if we did that more often in the church and realized, hey, you have something prepared, that's great. But you, you can always come back to that later, you know, and right now you need to focus on the people in front of you and, and on the questions that they have about what you're talking about. Mm. I think that would solve a lot of the problems that we have with with youth and people leaving the church and with a culture that says we're so anti-intellectual that you know, um, whereas Christianity, what Christianity offers is a life where we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, which is the, the opposite of being anti-intellectual. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Oh, well, yeah, Lewis uh, had questions that were arising from his own personal experience. His mother died of cancer. Now, that raises the question that so many people ask. Uh, if there's a good, all-powerful, loving God, then 
quite a bad things happen in the world. More specifically, why did my mother die? And so that's not the sort of question that most people are equipped to answer or deal with. There's mainly a cry of pain, but when you're a child, it's, uh, it's important to have both parents. But in Lewis's case, for all practical purposes, he had neither parent because he was shipped off to boarding school. He only saw his father a few weeks a year. So he, he was on his own. He didn't have a caring environment, a nurturing environment, uh, that, and it was a matter of just uh, beating information into his skull. You know, for, for a long time in our culture, we had the sense that a family consisted of a, of a mother and the father and the children, and that's no longer the case. We have a, um, now what's normal is that um, there might be one parent or there might be a step parent as well as parents and then half brothers and half sisters who may be all living together and they might not. And we no longer have that kind of normalcy that we once came to expect. And this creates a lot of opportunities for the church to be the family that's stable and caring uh, is a place where children and teenagers can feel they belong. So Lewis didn't have that. So he, he was not getting the kind of answers you would normally expect. Well, it's a, it's a well-known fact that, that Lewis, you know, didn't become a Christian until his adulthood. What were his thoughts about religion and, and God when he was an adolescent? Uh, as Lewis was, was growing up, he just assumed uh, church and God and Jesus. He didn't really have any questions about that. He went to church every Sunday. When he was in his early teenage years, and in those days, everyone studied Latin in what we would call middle school. He was reading the uh, stories of all the Greek and Roman gods and all of the mythologies. The teachers dismissed it all. Oh, this was just mythologies. It was all fantasy. There was nothing much to it. He began to think, well, then how do we know that our stories are true? I mean, these were what they believed and we believe the Bible. Why do we believe the Bible? And ours is true, but they believed other things, and theirs is false. And uh, no one was explaining to him about the uh, authority of Scripture, why the Bible is different from all other books. And I think this is a huge issue in conservative Christian life today, because we talk about the Bible as inerrant or infallible, but that doesn't get to the question of, well, how do we know it's true, or that God is real, or uh, more important, well, not more importantly, but also, how do we know the Bible is revelation from God? And uh, I've done a, a cursory survey of major evangelical theologians today, and I'm shocked that most of them don't answer the question. Older theologians always did, and it's a major theme in the New Testament. We know the Bible is true because the prophecies have been fulfilled. This is uh, the teaching of Jesus. It's the teaching of Paul. It's the teaching of Peter. It's all through the New Testament. You know, anybody can say, oh, I have, I speak for God. We, every religion has its holy book. But do you have any way for testing that? And God gave Moses the test. Uh, God told Moses that he would send prophets. And he said, now, Moses, you're probably wondering, how can you tell if somebody is my prophet? Because anybody can say, thus saith the Lord. And God said, the way you'll know he's my prophet is he will tell you something's going to come to pass and it will happen. If it doesn't happen, he's not my prophet. And that's the simple test of what makes the Bible different from any other holy book. Because the Bible is the only holy book of the world's religions that actually contains prophecies um, that are then fulfilled, that can be observed and tested. Lewis didn't have that. No one was answering those questions. And so he just began to believe oh, well, Christianity is just another myth like all the other myths. And from there, he gradually drift, uh, drifted into atheism. That didn't change, really, until he was a young adult. But as he was, as he was getting ready to uh, go off to college, to Oxford, and then to war when he was 18 years old, he had adopted a strict materialist view of the universe. Nothing exists but matter. All causes are natural causes. There are no causes external to the physical universe because there is nothing external to the physical universe. And his teacher, uh, W.T. Kirkpatrick, uh, was, was a logician and taught him strict logic and reasoning. Lewis was deeply committed to this materialist view of the universe. But 
there was a fly in the ointment. And at the same time, just like you, he was a voracious reader. And the kinds of stories he loved to read were stories of heroism and courage and sacrifice. He particularly loved the story that you find in a number of places of the of the knight who goes off on a quest to the end of the world and he overcomes uh, dire challenges and usually he's doing it in the service of a great lady and uh, no sacrifice is too great to reach the unreachable star, to um, beat the unbeatable foe. You know, it's that story of um, Don Quixote. And Lewis loved this story and the values attached to it. Integrity and honor and truthfulness and all these, these myriad values. But the problem is, in a materialist universe in which nothing exists but matter, there are no values. There's just brute matter. There's nothing good, nothing bad. There's just what is. Nothing is beautiful. Nothing is ugly. Things just are. And that was the beginning of the um, crack in his materialism, when he began to believe that there really are values because he had experienced them. He had experienced beauty. He had experienced affection. He had experienced guilt. But along the way, he'd also had an indescribable experience that he couldn't define and he couldn't find a cause to it because it happened in all sorts of different situations. He couldn't make it happen. Years later, he would call it joy, but not simply happiness. It's it's this deep longing as though there's something there and it's eluded you and you don't have it, but you know it's there and you want it, but you don't know what it is. And uh, it's deeper than an aesthetic experience. And he, and he really just couldn't adequately describe it, but it happened to him a number of times as a child. And so he had had these experiences that told him, maybe we're not alone. Maybe there is something that doesn't meet the eye. That would have been where he was at the end of his adolescence. That's uh, that's really helpful, brother. Uh, what role did friendship play in C.S. Lewis's childhood and his teenage years? Friendship was the greatest um, joy, the greatest experience Lewis had in his life. He, loved, he valued friendship above any er other earthly experience. And part of it was he did not have a friend until he was 16 years old. He had his brother, and his brother was his playmate, but his brother was several years older than he was. And when his brother went off to school, he was there at home by himself. And then, though his brother and he went to the same school for a few years, because the brother was older, he went off to another school. And by the time Jack got to that school, the brother was off to college. And so they, he was alone most of his childhood. And remember, uh, they picked on him. They bullied him. So it wasn't just that he was alone. He was made to feel less than worthy. And then all of a sudden, when he was, it was 1914, Easter of 1914, there was a little boy who lived across the street who was his brother Warney's age, uh, three years older, I think. He was sick in bed, and the family had sent word he'd love a visit. He'd like to have some company. Well, Lewis and his older brother had never paid this boy any attention. He was sort of seen as the odd one out. They didn't care for his company. They thought he was dull. But for whatever reason, perhaps the first time Lewis had ever demonstrated an act of kindness, because the fact is, at that time in his life, he was a bit of a, a handful, a uh, pretty selfish little boy, thought of himself first. But he went across the street to see this little boy. And there lying on the bedside table was a book about Norse mythology. Now, Lewis himself had only recently come across North mythology, and he thought it was the cat's meow. He thought it was fabulous, and it evoked in him this sense of what he called northernness. And the first time he had, had delved into a book of Norse mythology, he had that indescribable feeling that kept arising that he would eventually call joy. And he associated it then, from then on, with, with northernness, though it, opening a book in the future didn't cause it to happen, but it reminded him that it had happened. And so he said, oh, do you like that? And 
uh, the other little boy, whose name was Arthur Greaves, said, do you like that? And all of a sudden, they were leaping through the book, and they became best friends for the rest of their lives. Now, this is uh, critical for me, because without that friendship, I wouldn't have known what C.S. Lewis was thinking as a boy. By the way, his full name was Clive Staples Lewis. And as a teenager, he almost deserved it. But um, he decided he didn't want to be called Clive or Staples. So when he was a, a boy, he told us, he informed his father that his name was Jaxy. And he changed that to Jax. And eventually it just became Jack. So to his friends and family, he was always Jack Lewis. So Jack Lewis wrote to Arthur Greaves every week from um, the time he was 16 until he went away to the war in France. And in these letters, he tells us everything he's thinking, everything he's feeling, what he hates, what he loves, what he learns, what he thinks about things, what he thought about God what he thought about Jesus. It's all there. That was the primary resource I had in, um, in writing this book were those letters that Lewis himself wrote in the evening describing what was going on with him. That's really, uh, that's really, really fascinating to learn more about uh, the influence of uh, friendship in Lewis's life. Um, do we do we need more men like C.S. Lewis, and what would they look like in terms of their Christian life and ministry? Well, we do, it, and really, with the Inklings Fellowship, our little organization, we look to Lewis and Tolkien and their circle of friends as role models. We don't venerate them. Everybody has their, their failings, and Lewis certainly had his. But what Lewis did, he learned to think about his vocation, his calling as a teacher from a Christian perspective. And so the, the, the same idea carries on, how do you be a Christian banker? How do you be a Christian engineer? How do you go about being a Christian carpenter? And he raises the question, he sort of gives a model of how, how to uh, go about your life, um, not in any extraordinary way. He didn't intend to be known as an apologist for the Christian faith. He wanted to be a good writer because he was an, a professor of English literature. Uh, he wanted to do good work, uh, but he wasn't thinking of a career as a professional Christian. He was just thinking of doing his duty. And that term would come out, especially during World War II. For Lewis, his war work during World War II was to serve the church. And he wasn't a preacher, but he could go to the RAF camps and talk to the men, which he did. You know, in youth ministry, what we need more than anything else are a few more adults whose children are not in the youth group, that is, adults who have survived raising teenagers, to just hang around. Not, not do any teaching, not do any leading, just hang around and talk to the teenagers. That's critical. And that's essentially what Lewis was doing. Yes, he would give a little lecture, but then he'd hang around and talk to the men after the lecture. Uh, so we need more Christians who realize that Christianity is more than Sunday morning, more than the uh, mechanics of faith, reading your Bible, praying, but uh, recognize how it carries over into daily walk. And it doesn't mean giving lectures to people all the time. Often it means listening rather than talking. But most of all, it involves listening to the Holy Spirit's leading as to what should I be doing with my life right now. Yeah, that's that's really, really helpful. Well, how where can people uh, go to find out more about your work online, either on social media or otherwise? Well, the Inklings Fellowship has a website. It's www.inklingsfellowship.org. And there you'll find information about our conferences, our retreats, our um, uh, triennial meetings in Oxford. There are also some resources there. I put some uh, some of my books are available now um, in PDF form off of the website, a variety of, of different resources we have for people that would be interested. Wonderful. Well, you know, there's a, there's a lot that we can cover uh, in the course of, of this interview that we haven't about C.S. Lewis. And just as we wrap up our conversation today, do you have any takeaways? Well, I think it's important to realize that in conversion, uh, a lot takes place before someone actually uh, comes to faith in Christ. 
And we certainly see that with, with C.S. Lewis. And sometimes we get frustrated. We tell somebody about Jesus and they're not interested. Well, you remember Stephen told Paul about uh, Jesus and Paul had him stoned to death. That's not a very good start. But uh, one thing we need to bear in mind is that the Holy Spirit is doing things uh, of which we're not aware. So the last thing we want to do is give up uh, on someone just because they're not responsive. They might not be responsive for 10 or 15 years. You remember I said that I was involved in the committee to reelect the president. When I resigned that post, the person who took over the job was named Lee Atwater. Uh, years later, he would uh, be the chairman of uh, George Bush's campaign campaign for president, and Lee was uh, the most amoral person I knew. He feared neither God nor man, and yet he came to faith in Christ. It took years for that to happen, years, and it only happened close to his death, but it did happen before that final crisis of his death. I've got the letters back and forth as he was wrestling through it privately. I'm the, I hold the Charles Colson Chair of Faith and Culture, and Chuck Colson was able to sit by Lee's bed uh, there when he had cancer and talk to him. So many people play many roles in someone coming to faith, and the case of C.S. Lewis is just one example of that. So Parents, um, don't give up hope and don't be discouraged, but don't think it relies on you. It relies on the Holy Spirit. That's really well said, Hal. Uh, I really have enjoyed uh, getting to chat with you beforehand, and, and just our conversation about this subject is, is so needed because, you know, we do need to help our young people, and it's it's encouraging to hear how C.S. Lewis can help us do that. So thank you so much for uh, helping our listeners think through that. Thank you for having me today. It's been a pleasure. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for listening. We hope that you were encouraged by today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you get your podcast. For more uplifting and thought-provoking content, please visit us online at servantsofgrace.org. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Servants of Grace and on Facebook at facebook.com slash servantsofgrace. We hope you have a blessed day and we will see you next time.